Wir sind live. Hi everybody, welcome to the International Maritime Museum of Hamburg. We are glad you decided to join us today for our first heavy metal tour of the International Maritime Museum of Hamburg. My name is Damien and my name is Garrett. I am the curator here as well as my colleague of course. And um, we decided to do this tour for you today because in better days today would be the famous Wacken Heavy Metal Festival. And around these times of the year a lot of you guys are here in the museum. We see you because you wear stuff so like we do. <laughs> so we know you are here sometimes, you like it, you like history and because you cannot be here with us today and we all miss you. Today we do a heavy metal tour, show you some stuff from the museum, some exhibits that are linked to things that are popular in heavy metal culture. And first thing where we start of course are the Vikings and their beautiful ships, which you can see here in this showcase. There is a long ship. That ship kite that ship type was used for warfare, for raids, for example, and they were in the medieval times the best ships, if you look at Europe at least, you could get technologically masterpieces, beautifully shaped like nature, like fish or, or seabirds. They were very fast, they could really compete with a modern racing yacht, under good circumstances at least, and, and also the mystery of their quality was in the way they were built because to get the planks for the ship house the Vikings split the wood radially and that made the planks much more flexible and sturdy and that added to the quality of the ships. And then of course we have the other ship types that the Vikings frequently used. It's the trading ship or merchant vessel, the so-called Knorr. And, um, those were more seaworthy than the long ships and they were used for the expeditions to both Iceland, Greenland or even North America. And, and they were mainly sailed. You know, the long ships and all the other Viking ships that we have in mind, they, they were both sailed and rowed, but the merchant ships were only um, sailed and the, the, the oars were only used for maneuvers. And then we have something else inside this, next to the trading ship, because it was a commodity, an article for trade, and the weapon of the common man, the bearded axe. Here's the blade of one, it's an original, probably from Norway, more than a thousand years old. And these weapons were, of course, um, tools and weapons, and everybody had one. So if you didn't have a sword, you had of course a bearded axe and it would do the job of killing your enemies as well. But it's not always about killing in history. Of course, these Viking bearded axe became for centuries and centuries the axes of the shipwrights. So they were used in shipbuilding well into our times. So here we have the Vikings, dreaded warriors of their time. Um, and in heavy metal culture, of course, uh, the ferocious, uh, the, the dread for the word that they spread, that is, that is uh, popularized in metal. But we, as historians, of course, know, and you know too, that um, the Vikings were traders, craftsmen, um, discoverers, they were everything. And besides that, sometimes they were pirates. So, now my colleague is showing you some of the imprints that they left in heavy metal culture. So, I first wanted to uh, to say a short word about why are Vikings so important in heavy metal culture? Where does it come from? There is actually, uh, for the non-metal heads among you, uh, there is a musical, so a sub-genre from the, from the heavy metal culture called Viking metal. Um, um, one could say the origin of Viking metal uh, comes from um, uh, uh, one album by a Swedish band known, uh, known as Bathory. Uh, they released one album in 1988 and this is commonly considered as the first, um, the first Viking metal album of all times. But 
I was thinking about uh, is there any uh, any example of Viking subjects uh, taking into heavy metal culture? What, what was the first? And correct me if I'm wrong, but the first is actually from the year 1970, and it is this wonderful album. It's the opener. So. This is the third album by Led Zeppelin, a masterpiece. Some may say it is not heavy metal, it is hard rock or proto-heavy metal or whatever. But the thing is, the first song of this album is called The Immigrant Song. And uh, The Immigrant Song is actually about Vikings. Well, it's a metaphor about Vikings and about Led Zeppelin becoming popular in North America. Uh, Garrett said it before. Uh, the Vikings traveled to North America around the year 1000, Leif Erikson from Greenland and originally from Iceland, but from Greenland, traveled to North America what he, to a place in Newfoundland uh, that he called Wineland. And this is what the song says. The song starts with the, um, with the lyrics start saying, we come from the land of the ice and snow, of the midnight sun, sun where the hot springs blow. This is Iceland, and they say the hammer of the gods will lead our ships to new land. So, like Ericsson went with his expedition to North America. So, this is actually a very old example, the oldest example of Viking subjects in heavy metal culture, and uh, also uh, an amazing song. But now I'm going to um, speak to you about uh, another band and uh, actually how this band is related to heavy metal culture. We're going to move a little bit in this direction and uh, of the band I'm going to speak to you about. I haven't taken the tea with me. I have, I have taken the t-shirt. So, some of you will know the band. It's Manowar. The, they are the self-proclaimed kings of metal. Um, well, some love them, some hate them. Most people do a little bit of both, uh, like uh, myself. And the interesting thing about Manowar is their name. Their name is actually uh, rooted in maritime history. Um, so. Man of War had this album from 1988 called Kings of Metal. That's actually, the t-shirt is actually from the album. Uh, they have the song Kings of Metal, and in that song they say, um, Man of War, Man of War, living on the road. Which is wrong, because Man of Wars did not live on the road, they lived at sea. So where does this name Man of War come from? Please. Me a little bit more. Actually, the name Manowar was used since the 15th century in English to describe a larger battleship or warship. The, the, the name battleship doesn't apply very well in the 15th century. The first ones were the Karaks. That's a very interesting type of ship that was um, a mixture of northern European influences and Mediterranean influences. They were the first larger, larger ships that could carry weight, <coughs> so you could put cannons on them. Quite a lot, even if later there would be larger ships. So these kind of ships could carry a lot of soldiers and a lot of cannons. So uh, in English they started being named Man Wars. Later this name until the 19th century, this name will stay to describe ships that are large, have a lot of cannons. So from a frigate to here, you have, for example, here, that's a beautiful, that's a French one, um, the Flore Americaine. Um, that's an example of a frigate. Everything which is as big as this or bigger, it's a man of war. It goes until a ship of the line of the first rank. So, uh, first rate, sorry, first rate. Um, those were the bigger ones. Uh, by the way, the name, she oh yeah, we have, we have, Gary, just for me. We have a, a nice paint, painting describing the Battle of Trafalgar, a battle between Manowars. 
Um, a lot of cannons, very loud. Maybe that's the reason why uh, Manowar uh, uh, took this name. They like to call themselves the loudest band on earth. And um, yeah, so um, so these are the these are the Manowars. They are large ships with a lot of cannons. But actually, the thing is, there is another song in the, in the album that came before Kings of Metal. The, the album and the song also are called Fighting the World. And in this song, Manowar say, uh, stripes of a tiger don't uh, wash away, Manowar's made of steel, not clay. Which is, again, wrong. Because Manowar's were very sturdy ships, but they were not made out of steel. They were made out of wood. Later, after the industrial, uh, during the Industrial Revolution, starting uh, uh, around the mid of the 19th century, ships will start to have uh, a protection made of metal, and later they will be made of steel. So actually, Manowar, if they have wanted to have a more metal name, they could have called themselves ironclad. Ironclads are the ships, or some of the ships that fought in the American Civil War, this was the first conflict where these ships fought, um, they were mostly made of wood, but protected by metal. Or even a cooler name for Man of War would have been Dreadnought. Dreadnought is the name used, that's quite a long story, but it's the name used for the very, very large battleships made of steel with big guns and so on, uh, that were used during the First World War. Um, actually, nowadays there are both bands called uh, Ironclad and uh, called Dreadnought. But so well, that doesn't surprise me at all. Yeah, Manowar will say. But the thing, the thing. Okay, next story, next step. Let's 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 uh, um, leave Manowar away. <laughs> and um, so the thing is, for seafarer, the main danger uh, in, uh, in all through maritime history is not other seafarers with weapons. So it's not other battleships or pirates. No, actually the main danger all through history is the sea itself, the cruel sea. Um, out of this danger that comes from the sea, uh, just thinking, the storms, you name it, out of this danger came fear, out of this fear came superstition, and out of superstition came legends. And about this kind of legends, uh, Garrett, you yeah. have something to say. Me one so. step above. Yeah, so one of the most feared regions on Earth during the Age of Sail was, of course, the region of Cape Horn, which we depict on this map, and there you see many shipwrecks lay there. These are not all of them, but there must be thousands, even tens of thousands of them. And the tour around Cape Horn was so dangerous and so dreaded by sailors that when the age of sail finally came to a close in the 20th century, um, the last captains who commanded these ships around Cape Horn founded the most exclusive brotherhood in history. And that is the brotherhood of the Cape Horners. They were founded in 1934 in France, in the city of Saint-Malo. And after World War II, they internationally opened their ranks to everyone. And surprisingly, in 1945, they explicitly opened their ranks also for German sailors, which was the first act of reconciliation, of um, understanding each other after the horrible war and after all the horrible things that the Germans did. You must imagine that. That was a sign sent out by sailors. So, those were the Cape Horners and they were so exclusive because if you want to become a Cape Horner, first, you had to be a captain who commanded a sailing ship without machinery around Cape Horn from east to west facing the storms. And 
there's another thing. Your ship had to carry cargo. So only then you could become a Cape Horner. Later on they loosened these uh, um, rules a bit and they said, okay, if you were a sailor who were, was on such a ship and you became a captain later in your career, then you could also become a Cape Horner. <coughs> and if you never became a captain, then you could become an extraordinary member. So, yes, you could rank, uh, join the ranks. And this Brotherhood, they, they met each year until 2004. And then they had their last worldwide meeting. And then they closed down the Brotherhood out of old age because the last living of these legendary men were well into their 80s or even 90s. And today, probably none of them is alive. I don't know exactly, probably one or two. And the Cape Horners, they had a heraldic animal that will link us to our next heavy metal topic. And here you have their flag. Yes, the, the city Saint-Malo is named where the Brotherhood had been uh, founded. And here you have, I think it, it reads Amical International Caponnes, so it's French, I'm not going to pronounce that a lot better than me. <laughs> and the, the heraldic animal is the albatross holding that ring in his uh, beak. And the, the Cape Horners believe that you could never harm, you should never harm or even kill an albatross, because an albatross is said to be um, a bird that carries the souls of the deceased sailors into heaven, and some say he might even be such a soul. And then there is an old legend of a sailor, and you will know what I'm going to tell you now, who um, killed such a bird. And I can show you something about this here. We have here an old painting, actually that is a reprint that shows an albatross flying majestically above the southern ocean and the legend I'm referring to, or I wanted to refer to, is of course the rhyme of the ancient mariner by the British um, writer Samuel Tyler Coleridge and he tells the story of a sailor, a mariner, a captain who killed such a bird and he gets doomed for this act of cruelty by God and he is, is uh, some kind of a flying Dutchman guy who he sails the sea as a living corpse. His men are all dead and he will never escape this horrible situation until he repents and of course finally he repents and gets saved and there is a band that we all love. Iron Maiden of course who wrote a song about this story of course with the same name and here it is. My colleague can tell you now the heavy metal so, story. So. Well, this is the legendary album from Iron Maiden, Power Slave, uh, released in 1984. Uh, an amazing album with a lot of subjects that are historically rooted. So uh, you have the, um, the Royal Air Force in World War II. You, uh, you have a song about a pharaoh uh, considering his own death, his mortality, being a god. Uh, which is a title song, Power Slave, that's why it's an Egyptian cover. And the last song, 13, 13 minutes long, The Rhyme of the Ancient Mariner, which is an incredibly epic, almost, almost a, a, a rock opera in itself. An amazing song, which is based on the poem uh, by Coleridge, The Rhyme of the Ancient Mariner. Um, Iron Maiden have quite a lot of uh, um, uh, histories, uh, songs relating to, uh, to literature um, and what we have taken out of our, our library relating to the Ancient Mariner, uh, one of the, in my opinion, most beautiful books in our library. Um, this is an edition from the 1870s of the Rhyme of the Ancient Mariner translated to English with the original the engravings, the illustration, sorry, translated to, to German, to German, yeah. sorry, translated to German, uh, with the um, original illustrations that um, the French artist Gustave Doré did. 
did for this book. They are just beautiful. And Gustave Doré, which was a um, French artist who uh, made illustrations for almost all great works of literature that have been until the late, the late uh, 19th century. Uh, he has a Bible, he has a, uh, he has a Don Quixote, um, he, yeah, he has an ancient mariner, and his works are actually also quite heavy metal. There is a lot of metal bands that have used the art of Gustave Doré in their covers. I am thinking, for example, about the uh, Norwegian black metal band Emperor, which almost exclusively has used... Oh, and, and you can... Oh, and Garrett is wearing an Emperor shirt. I didn't know that. <laughs> oh, blood. Yes. So, um, so that is Gustave Doré, and this is this, this amazing work with a very maritime subject, the Rhyme of the Ancient Mariner. Actually, before, uh, many people who wrote about this tour already said, oh, you are going to speak about the Rhyme of the Ancient Mariner. It's possibly the most, the most well-known maritime song in heavy metal. <laughs> and now we're going to another subject uh, uh, related, uh, um, who links the maritime and, and heavy metal. And this is piracy. So uh, let's move a couple of steps to our area dedicated, dedicated to the history of piracy. Well, not to all of it, because there has been piracy since there has been shipping. So since, since the dawn of times, and there is still, uh, piracy is still a big problem. But what do we know about, so what do we, we usually think about when we think about pirates is uh, um, uh, an era we uh, know as the golden age of piracy. This is um, between around the year six, uh, 1690 and the year 1730 in the area of the Caribbean, like Pirates of the Caribbean, well, the movies. The thing is, um, this was a period of, uh, uh, this was an, an area and a period with a lot of conflicts, uh, international geopolitical conflicts between France, Holland, Spain, and uh, England, for most of it. Um, the countries used pirates, like hired pirates, like corsairs, um, to um, disrupt the merchant uh, navy of the other countries. And um, some of these uh, hired pirates uh, decided to go freelance and abandoned their king or queen in, the, in the, that time and decided to, uh, to go on their own. This is what we know as the pirates. And since the Romantic era uh, in, the, um, in the 19th century, um, they have a very important place in the um, Western popular culture. You have books, uh, Stevenson, Treasure Island being the most well-known of them. Um, you have uh, later movies, computer games, and of course, a lot of music. And we being right now in Hamburg, yes, this one, there is one album which is the origin of pirate metal, and it's an album from Hamburg. And it's the legendary Under Rolly jo uh, Jolly Roger, sorry, <laughs> Under Jolly Roger by Running Wild, one of the best metal bands that ever came out of this wonderful city. And actually, Hamburg has quite a, quite a good link to, uh, to piracy. There is quite a lot of history of piracy in this city, but I'm going to let the local guy, Gerrit, tell you about that. Yeah, I'm from Hamburg, actually. Okay. <laughs> so, before we go to what Damian introduced you to, I have a funny little anecdote. He just showed you this album under Jolly Roger and as a heavy metal fan when I curated this exhibition and wrote all the text that you see at the walls, I wanted to name my text about pirates, of course, under Jolly Roger. But the editor to whom I had to present all what I had written, he said, no, there must be a the between under and jolly, otherwise it's not correct. So, I think this guy was not into metal, but then again, uh, he was the best translator we ever worked with, so kudos to him. And now we have um, 
This guy here resting on his pole. This is the replica of a skull that was found right behind me actually, opposite of that window at the Grasbrook. Strange name. That was the place where in the medieval times um, the pirates were beheaded and their chopped off heads were nailed onto poles to be presented to the public for deterrence. People walked by there, seeing the skulls on the poles, seeing the birds who were ripping off the rotting flesh, that is very heavy metal actually, uh, from the bones. And um, they said, well, this is how a pirate ends, so I better be good or stay good. So that is um, a skull of a pirate. Nobody knows his name, but then again, because one very famous pirate from northern Germany, the most well-known actually, Klaus Störtebecker, he was beheaded there in the year 1401. And some people said, well, probably, probably this is him, but we don't think so. But he was a pirate, a real pirate. If you want to see the original of these skulls, this is just a replica, you have to go to the Hamburg Museum, which is not very close to us, so actually it's worth by going there either. After you were here, of course. <laughs> and yeah, this is our pirate. So that is what we could show you about this topic for today. And I think we are now nearing a point where we had to leave the age of sail and go with you into a completely different part of the museum. So we have to take two staircases upstairs now, but I think you follow us anyway. Yes. We are going, we are going where the ships are made of steel. So uh, uh, it's going to be worth it to, to, to walk a couple of stairs. By the way, the, for the ones who don't know the museum, um, uh, this museum is housed in the oldest still standing warehouse of the port of Hamburg. Uh, it's, uh, the exhibition is nine stores high, so we are just going to be able to show you a, yeah, a glimpse of what we have to offer. Uh, and we are hoping, uh, um, yeah, maybe so to see you all especially uh, when better times come and international travel is allowed again and festivals are allowed again, uh, which we also miss. So, we are now on the fourth floor. We are going to go to the fifth one. But I think you, you wanted to say something here, get it? Yes, of course. We cannot walk simply by these badges of honor and medals if we would not remember beloved guy who's no longer with us, Mr. Lemmy Kilmister from Motorhead, of course, who was a great musician, a great guy, but also very well known to be a collector of these kind of things, weapons, badges of honor, uniform parts. So um, he would have had quite a lot of fun in this part of the museum, but to the best of our knowledge, he was never here. So probably his ghost is. <laughs> so, All look. right. Let's, let's uh, move one store ahead and, um, and we are right now on deck six. We call we call it floor six because it makes sense. Um, this is the, the, this floor, this deck, is dedicated to um, the maritime military history of the modern times. This is between the mid 19th century until today. And uh, it's quite larger, but we cannot uh, take you to a whole tour because of time reasons. So I uh, was considering about, I wanted to speak about one ship, give you an idea. Um, and well, here you have the, the larger Spanish ships, the Yamato, the Diabetes, the Bismarck, which is uh, heavily represented in heavy metal culture as well very iconic ship from the Kriegsmarine, the Navy of Nazi Germany. But there is another story I thought would be more interesting, and it's also about um, a cover of an album. And I have it here. It's so, nicht, so, nicht. Oh yeah, uh, I've been told I have to put it in the light. 
So this is an album by Gorgorov, a Norwegian black metal band from the 90s. Well, still, still exists, I'm not 100% sure, or 100% sure. But, um, well, Gorgorov made this al album in 1998, uh, an album I like a lot. And if you look to the cover, it's called Destroyer. Black metal, we have to say, it's a, it's a music uh, that relates uh, very strong on negative things. It's uh, mostly about uh, death, suffering, and so on. Um, so you see the, the portrait of Inferos, of the, the leader of the band, and uh, you see a picture of a warship burning. Uh, this ship, uh, this is actually the interesting thing. The album is called Destroyer, so it would be logical that the ship you see in this picture would be a destroyer, which is a type of ship. It is not. And funny enough, uh, the, the destruction of this ship, so the, the, the story behind this cover, is actually uh, not a story of death, or, well, it's war, it's World War II, but uh, um, it's actually a story of around 1,000 people surviving, which is rare in war. And it's about this ship you see right here. So this is actually um, the, the ship you are looking at, this, this wonderful model, uh, is the ship on the cover, not burning uh, in the model. Um, this is the Admiral Graf Spee. Uh, this ship was built uh, what's, so, it was built between 1932 and 1934 and uh, commissioned two years later, 1936, and became the flagship of the Kriegsmarine, of the um, uh, uh, Navy of Nazi Germany. And this ship had a very short story in World War II. Um, she was sent to the Southern uh, Atlantic before the war started, actually in preparation for when the war started, the Gulf Spee could uh, start raiding merchant ships uh, to, to disrupt the uh, merchant lines, especially uh, uh, of Great Britain. So that's what she did, actually pretty successfully, until December 39. In December 39, the ship met uh, a convoy uh, built by three cruisers uh, from the Ro uh, British Royal Navy. Um, due to an error of uh, Captain Langdorf, the captain of the Graf Spee, uh, he, made an he thought the force he was facing was not that big, so he decided to steam ahead to them and end their fight which he lost. Um, the, the ship, one of the ship, the um, uh, Ajax, I think, maybe I'm wrong, I'm not sure right now, but um, one of the British ships was very badly damaged, so was the Graf Spee. Uh, this battle, which is actually a battle or skirmish, but it's now as the Battle of the Plague River, is the first naval, naval battle of World War II. And um, it took place near the mouth of the Plate River between Argentina and Uruguay. So the Gaspe had to flee and needed repairs. So what they did, they entered the mouth of the um, Plate River, which is very wide but not very deep, and they aimed for Montevideo, the capital of Uruguay. Um, they thought Uruguay is a neutral, neutral country, but they underestimated the influence of British diplomacy in Uruguay. So the ship was there, more or less tra trapped because it couldn't cross to the other side to Argentina, uh, because in the center of the river, the river w was too slow to uh, let the ship cross. So they were in Montevideo, and Montevideo said, so uh, the Uruguayan government said, you can only stay here for uh, um, uh, 73. 76, 76 hours, and there was no possibility to do the necessary repairs on the ship in that time. They only had enough fuel for one day of steaming, and they were trapped. And on top of that, MI6 
defeated these people, uh, so the, the, the um, uh, Captain uh, Langdorf was defeated <coughs> false intelligence, false information, and he thought the, the, um, the Royal Navy had a very strong force waiting for them when they left uh, Uruguay. So, um, so regarding to the, to the um, or relating to the uh, orders the Kriegsmarine would have given to any one of them, uh, what Langdorf should have done is take his little bit over thousand men aboard, steam to the enemy, and be destroyed and killed, and probably almost nobody would have survived such a conflict. He did something else, actually, which is kind of surprising. He left all his men, except a skeleton crew of 40, on land in Montevideo. He went aboard with 40 men, laid explosive all over the ship, went back to his small boat, and let the ship burn. So this is what we call in, in maritime, uh, um, uh, uh, yes, so the word for this is scuttling. This is destroying your own ship, normally so the enemy won't get it at war. So, um, well, Langendorf committed suicide two days later. He went to, um, to Buenos Aires in, Argen in Argentina, committed suicide because of honor and so on. Uh, but actually almost a thousand or a little bit over, I don't know the exact number but right now, but uh, a lot of men survived because of that. Most of them stayed actually in the region, either in Argentina or in Uruguay. And actually uh, the descendants of these people uh, meet every year uh, near the tomb of Langendorf to honor him. Uh, the German Navy is not really sure if they should or should not honor him because um, uh, he saved a lot of lives, but uh, uh, they are not really sure. But he, he apparently was nevertheless quite an enthusiast follower of the criminal system of the National Socialists. But, um, well, this was actually the last story we wanted to tell you today. I think it's good to tell a story where people survive. Because actually, um, in my humble opinion, uh, it is very good when people don't die. <laughs> so, uh, on, this, uh, on this point, we would like to end this saying, stay safe, stay strong, and uh, whenever you are in town, we see you next year at Wacken or in the museum. We will be here and at Wacken, so my tickets are booked. See you, people. <laughs>